Hey guys, today we are going to be talking about Urel. We are going to be doing a, an ultimate Urel guide. And joining us today is the number one player in North America from last season. The man with a 76% win rate with Urel, the hero that he used to get to number one Grandmaster in North America. Liam, how are you doing today? I'm doing pretty well. How are you? I'm I am doing pretty good. So before we even get into a replay, because we did find a good replay to kind of show a chaotic game that you guys started losing at the start of that, um, and you kind of adjusted based off of a game where you were playing from behind the entire time. Uh, let's go into Urel's talents and let's explain kind of what build you go on Urel and the reasons for it. So let me let me pull up a, a, a build really quick for her so that you can see. Uh, we'll take the talents as we go through them. And let me go to a talent. Let's go to a new one. All right. Walk me through this build and what talents are we taking and why? All right. So at level one, you're going to want Dauntless, in my opinion, 100% of the time. Reason being 50 physical armor is a lot and you're going to have it up pretty much all the time because as you're you're going to want to be casting abilities as much as possible uh it also works against structures and pretty much all pve it works against so it's really really good and the majority uh, of pve I, I didn't mean to interrupt but the majority of pve is physical damage because even like the exactly. mage's auto attacks on a siege camp are physical damage because it's an auto attack uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean that that's gonna reduce fifty percent of almost all PVE damage, uh, except for things that you can dodge, like any sort of AOEs that they're gonna bring down. You could just walk away from. So that's that's huge in PVE. Exactly. Yeah. The level four. What are we taking and why? With with this build, you're gonna want to be jumping on the backline. So Aegis of Light lost a lot of value. Uh, with the old build. Jumping on your team was fine because you had Divine Seed at level 7 where your whole goal was to jump on your team and give them armor. Uh, but since they removed armor stacking, uh, it's it's not as good anymore, pretty much. And with this new build, uh, you can just jump on the backline and do a ton of damage. So Hand of Freedom is definitely the best pick here. And they, they, they also recently... Changed. Oh, yeah, sorry. I was probably just about to say the same thing. They recently changed yeah, yeah, it yeah. so you can use it on yourself. Even though it says grant an allied hero 35%, you can actually cast it on yourself. Exactly. You can self-cast it, and after you self-cast it, you can charge your abilities. So you'll be moving at increased move speed while you're channeling your abilities. So it's very, very good. It's a short cooldown as well, only 20 seconds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a really short cooldown. I mean, that's short enough you can get out of any... I mean most of the the routes that you might want to get out of but at the same time it 35 percent movement speeds faster than mount speed so it's really good exactly level seven what are we taking and why holy avenger got buffed recently it does an additional 25 percent damage whereas it used to only reduce the cooldown so it's just a lot of damage so it's very very good uh, especially with some talents later on that you'll see it'll pair well with those Level 10, what are we taking and why? I always go Ardent Defender. I think that the problem with Sacred Ground is it restricts you in an area, and with this build, you're going to want to be jumping all around all around the back line. So I always pick Ardent Defender. It is kind of lame that Dauntless prevents Ardent Defender in a sense, because the damage reduction will negate the healing. But Sacred Ground just isn't a good pick, in my opinion, because of the res restriction. Mm -hmm. I think that is one of the challenges. And we're going to watch the replay and see this play style. And you'll see very quickly why Sacred Ground just won't work. And it could be, I know there is going to be some people in the comments going, Oh, but this isn't on a point control map. Uh, and on a point control map, you should be able to hold the point forever. But even in those cases, uh, you're losing a very powerful ult. Um and you're losing the ability to jump in the back line in the case that there is, even on point control, the back line's not always on the point, especially on a map like Sky Temple, where uh, their, their front line's gonna sit on the point, their back line's gonna be kind of far away. If you wanna play Urel the way that Liam's playing Urel, uh, then it's going to, 
it's going to be very, very difficult to keep that sacred ground out longer than a couple seconds. Uh, now on to 13. What are we taking and why? Valence Chosen is, uh, if you hover over it, it's 30% spell power, 10% anytime you land an ability that's fully charged, which will pair really well with the level 7 talent. Another reason to take the 7 talent is because of Valence Chosen, because it stacks off of itself. Mm -hmm. So you'll be doing 25% more damage plus the 30% after you're spamming your E's a bunch. Yeah. Uh, the other ones, I just I wouldn't recommend them. The problem with the Elder Wars Peacekeeper is fully charging your Q in a team fight is really hard to do, unless you're DQing, which is that's something Webby used to do. The problem with that is you're gonna want to DW with this build, especially because at 16 you'll have the armor reduction. So slapping backliners or frontliners into your team can result in a really easy kill. Yeah, and that is something that I was going to bring up because Wubby's kind of the well-known, especially for anyone who follows Europe teams or watched like old HCC, uh, you you remember Wubby's playstyle. But there's a few things that have been changed since that, and that's where the playstyle is a little bit different. Um, some of the notable things that have been changed is uh, Dauntless uh, was a lot different in the past. Light of Karabor was different, and Marad's Insight was different. So what he used to do was he used to jump in, and this, you could damage anything. You could just use your Q or use any ability, and you would trigger this, and then your next basic attack would heal. Now you have to damage enemy heroes to trigger this. So where he used to be able to just hop in and auto-attack anything, now he has to always get hit someone with something. So you lost a lot of value with that because his, use, his, his old combo that he used to do was jump in, trait Q, auto-attack, and then W, auto-attack. And so even if he wasn't hitting anything, he was healing a lot. Um, but losing that, gaining Dauntless, really changes this a little bit. Um, why not Repentance, though? It's 75% slow on a one-second cooldown. Why aren't we going in this direction? Well, honestly, Valence Chosen is just basically a 30% damage increase. It's super significant, and... The slow is nice, but the original slow is usually good enough, in my experience. Yeah, I mean, so a 50% really slow is still slow. a big slow. So, yeah. level 16 tends to be a contentious, contentious one. Uh, what talent are we taking here and why? I always take Templar's Verdict. Uh, the armor reduction that you get from it and the 7% chunk is just super, super nice. The armor reduction is kind of underrated a lot of people don't realize how much minus 20 armor is especially in the front line you can knock them back into your team and they'll have minus 20 armor for four seconds and you can chunk them so in high level games this can just kill instantly if your team follows up off of it if you're in lower level games holy wrath can be good uh it's it's a lot better for solo queue if you're not like trusting your teammates really Templar's Verdict is always good, though. I always pick it personally because I just love the minus 20 armor. If you can get a minus 20 armor on somebody and then fully charge your E and land on them, you can end up doing like thousands of damage, especially paired with Valence Chosen. Mm -hmm. It's just a, a huge damage increase. And then finally, level 20, uh, the tier that you don't always get to, but when you do a uh, lot of heroes, this is their game ending talent. Uh, is Urel the same? Does Urel have a game-ending talent, or is it more just like a, a nice benefit of hitting level 20? Urel's entire playstyle, at least the way that I play here, is going to be landing your E's and off of that, knocking them into your team so they can follow up off of it. The way you counter Urel is you interrupt her E. If you can interrupt her E with this build, you'll, you're going to be a lot less impactful. But at 20, you get Seraphim, which... Grant's unstoppable for two seconds, so they can no longer interrupt your E. So your entire downside is basically just gone at 20. So I'd highly recommend taking Seraphim in all of your games. If you're in lower level uh, games and you just don't really know how to use it as much, it's kind of hard to use because it isn't activatable. So it's you do have to think about it, and it does take getting used to for sure. You can take Word of Glory. It's a... Uh, it's not bad. I personally don't take it because Seraphim is just so useful. 
and if you're good at using it, it can be really, really good. Now with Seraphim, one of the things that I always recommend to people with cleanse is look for very specific things. Like if you're not paying attention for very specific things and you're trying to pay attention to everything in existence, you're going to end up missing Seraphim a lot, or at least cleanse, because I, I use this advice a lot for cleanse. Would you recommend looking at the opposing team and going, okay, instead of me looking at every CC that they have, what are like the five that I could kind of predict their their posturing to be able to activate this right before they interrupt it? Like you see a Murd and you go, okay, well, he's going to step up towards me as I'm channeling E, and then I pop unstoppable before he sends out the hammer. Uh, do, you, do you think looking for very specific ones is, is key, or do you think that it's something that you should probably just practice enough to where you, you can handle literally anything that's thrown at you at any time? It definitely depends on their composition, but generally, I'd say what you can do is you can charge your E up, and right before you jump in, just click the unstoppable, and then you're pretty much good to go. I mean, it's a low enough cooldown, you could just do it every jump exactly. if you wanted it's, to. It's a 10 second cooldown, yeah, it's really really good yeah that's a that's a good idea actually i mean i didn't even think about that don't overthink it just just use it every time that you're jumping so uh that is the build guys this build will be in the description down below you can copy it you can import it and you can play around with this build but let's get into a replay and see what kind of play style we're going to be looking at so as we're getting into this game i do want to mention this is a master gm game and there are some important names in here uh maka one of the best range assassins in this game we've got shiggity uh he's a person who has usually four to six accounts in grandmasters at any given time frosty wind same way usually two or three accounts in grandmaster so this is a stacked game and we see ryokai as well he's been in a couple of my videos so a very very stacked game uh you are on a smurf and i do want to point that out so we will be following this but just a confirmation this is still your account right mm -hmm. yeah this is one of my smurf accounts so with that, we are entering the beginning of this game. What should you be looking for early game on Yorel? Is there anything in particular that you should be doing to gain an advantage? I know like uh, as a Rhaegar, you're going to be wanting to grab a camp at one minute and a camp at two minutes. Uh, as a Greyman, you might want to do the same thing. What should you be trying to do in the early game as Yorel? So first of all, right here, if you're going to fight mid, you want to look to jump on the back line and then slap them in like I just did there. It chunked Kira a bunch, so I think Stukov had to use his heal, which means he won't have it for this, where I can re-engage and do the same thing to the Garrosh, so he can't heal him there. A uh, good nade from Anna as well. In general, I'd recommend in lane, you're going to want to trait and then Q to get the maximum heal. Uh, whereas trait W, you're going to want to use in team fights. So when there, you're trading, the yeah. So when you're trading in like one on ones, or if you're just needing extra heals, you're gonna use trait Q off cooldown. Do you use Q a lot without trait? I do to proc Dauntless, but I don't use it too often in team fights now. Okay. You'll see there. I'm just constantly trait queuing to heal up because we don't have Maraud's insight. It's like my only source of sustain. Sustain. So it's really important. I do it again there. I W to get Dauntless for the tower shots. Mm -hmm. And you keep going back to this bush. Is this something that you tend to do a lot when you are just going in the one-on-one? -on -one? Uh, even not against Garrosh, but just against other stronger solo laners, stronger bruisers. You just generally kind of stay near here. And we see Shiggity freezing right in the range to throw into tower. Yeah, it's, it's a good freeze here from Shiggity. I just like to stay out of vision because any information you can prevent... Okay, here I made a mistake. I I kind of just got overzealous. There was no reason for me to do that. I just wanted to clear the wave, and I thought I could outplay Shiggity there, but he definitely capitalized on that. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, Generally, we, we saw you earlier jump in and immediately knock him back before he could land the yeah, throws. I'd exactly. imagine that's probably what you were going for again. Yeah, exactly. But, yeah, just staying out of vision is really important in high-level games because any information they don't have can, like... Like, for example, if I'm in that bush, they don't know that I'm bottom lane, so maybe they won't do something that they could do, like, somewhere else on the map because I could be there. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that I've noticed a lot from your games, especially in the games from uh, CCL anyways, is that out of the solo laners, you played much safer than pretty much everyone that I've seen 
when it comes to actually being in the solo lane. And then in team fights, you tended to play more aggressive than any solo laners that I've seen. And it just kind of shows that like n like having that safety allows it to where you're never the one giving the enemy team an experience advantage, right? Uh, so when you can get an experience advantage, you're going to do it. But you're never the one giving it to the opposing team. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's no reason to play super aggro early game in lanes. I, I find it just better to freeze lanes. So in this situation, uh, you are grabbing a fountain, your team's approaching this team fight, but you're not going there. Why not? So the reason I'm not going up is because I see that they're super close to level 7 and our team is not. So I want to get us level 7 before this. I try heading up here, but I realize a new Brack has already died, so I just decide double soaking is the best choice at this point. And do you find double soaking a, a solid option on solo laners? I mean, I know I, I tell a lot of people, like, early game, as a solo laner, if you've already won an objective or if you've already lost an objective, you double soak to try to gain a lead. Um, and is that the same thing with Urel, or do you, should you be trying to do camps, or should you be trying to do anything else with her? Uh, you can look to invade. Invading is really, really nice with Urel because of her entire kit. The whole ability to knock people off of points, for example, if you're invading a camp, it's really easy to knock them off the point and then steal that camp. But if your team doesn't want to look for invades, it's fine to just double soak. She's really good at double soaking as well. Mm -hmm. And I do want to point out, after that last engage, you immediately used um, your hand of freedom to get out of the fight, get to a safe position, and then mount up. Uh, guys, I, I'm not going to call this out every time because I'm telling you that I've watched this replay before and hand of freedom gets used probably 90 times. So just know that if you're not using it at least 20 times a game, you're not using it enough. Uh, it's a 20 second cooldown and I kid you not, it's used like 90 times this game. Mm -hmm. It's very, very useful. So we're approaching a team fight in the mid game. What is your game plan here? What's going through your mind? My goal there was to knock, knock the enemies away so they couldn't kill our backliners. They did end up dying anyway. I'm not sure how Nubarak died there, but I assume Garrosh got a good combo on him. Mm -hmm. Right here we see here, uh, Ryo getting rather low. Yeah, I jump on Ryo. I tried to hold my W to negate his blink. Mm -hmm. He ended up not casting it, probably because he knew that I had it as well, so he was waiting for me to cast it. So yeah, I, I ended up knocking it back and then eing right back on him for the kill. Oh yeah, and, and I mean, a lot of times this comes down to... Uh, a little bit of a, a game of chicken, right? Where it, it's like, mm -hmm. if, if he uses it too early, then you jump on him. If he uses it too late, then you, you knock him back. But at the same time, if he can bait you to use your, your W early, then he's able to get out alive. So in this case, um, you ended up winning this game of chicken. But I do want to point out the combo that you used for the people that are practicing URL. If you see someone getting to about 50 to 70% health, depending on their their hero if they're lower health hero you can do a little bit more but this full combo does about 70 percent of an assassin's health uh ranged assassin anyways where you charge up an e you land the e you auto attack and then you trait w and then they're stunned for a little point where you can charge back up your e again and then you can land that about 70 percent of their health so for any of the, you guys that are learning url and you just want that little bit more impact it's a great combo to, to practice in try mode and then bring that into a game so as we're approaching mid game what do you think people should be looking to doing is it still kind of double soaking is there a point where you should be looking to try to do something different and especially when we're getting into mid game team fights uh does the play style shift at all uh, the general idea in team fights is always going to be to jump onto them and then to knock them back into your team so they can follow up and look for kills. Um, in the mid game, right now at least, I'm just looking for a kill on Li Ming because there's not much else to do. Um, I mean, your it team's covering on... the soak, really, so you yeah. don't need to worry too much about that. It depends on what your team's trying to do. If they want to invade, as I said before, your rail can be really good for invading. But right now they're kind of just playing safe, so I'm just doing the same, soaking this lane. So in this right situation... Here, oh, sorry. Feel free to go. I was going to say Anna gets a good sleep. I probably should have W'd right here instead of Ying, because as you see there, she blinks it as I wake her up. If I had W'd there, I might have been able to knock her back into our 
giants and maybe killed her with Anna. So that was just a misplay on my end. Mm -hmm. And I think this is one of the things that's that's very, very good to always do. is uh, You can watch your own replays and you can learn, but it's kind of difficult to learn like things that you don't know. So the only thing that you can really learn from your replays is like situations like that, where you can go, okay, well, this is what I did. This is how I fix this if I ever hit this situation again. And it takes a, a really good player to be able to look at these, these fights and go, okay, this is what should have been done differently. So... Again, guys, you, you can't always learn what you don't know in a replay, but you can still learn something. So in this fight, I mean, your your Alarak's already down. Uh, your your Nubarak's a little far away. I think you guys have to just give this. Yeah, my goal there was to just delay as long as I could. Hopefully, my team would rise in time, but sadly, they weren't able to. I was able to get my ult off here, absorb all that damage, and I baited a lot of cooldowns. I wanted to keep them there because I noticed Stukov had low mana, so he wasn't able to participate much in this fight. Mm -hmm. um, so so yeah. I'm pausing here because I do want to explain a little bit about how Righteous Hammer works in comparison to normal knockbacks. Uh, so what happens a lot of times is when, if you're playing ETC and you do your knockback, and if the enemy is sitting right here, they are going to be knocked back in this direction. And it actually works that way for a lot of knockbacks. Uh, Stukov's is even the same way. So if Stukov's knockback is aimed, let's assume it's aimed in this direction as far as his swipes go. And this is poorly drawn, but you guys love it. Don't lie. Um, if Stukov is sitting, or if the, the enemy is sitting right here, and your, Stu your, your knockback goes like this, it's going to send them in this direction. Well, Urel's W works differently from every other knockback in the game, in which it is always going to knock back in the direction that you're aiming, not in the knockback radius, not of the location of the knockback radius. So uh, her knockback is going to look something like this. And this is where Liam ends up doing this knockback right here. And it, again, a normal knockback would send Stukov this way. But Yorel's is different in that it sends it in the direction that you are aiming, which is this way. And I, I do want to give a slight disclaimer that on replays there is a bug where all of Yorel's charged abilities is going to look like it's aimed at where I'm holding my mouse. So you won't actually get to see where Liam aimed this, uh, but you will be able to see the impact of it. And so this is the direction that it was aimed. It's a unique ability and using it this way can make it to where you can get those edge cases where you're just right on the same distance or side as them, and you can still send them right into your team. Mm -hmm. so we see right there that you did aim it. You were right on the side of this person. You were still able to send them into this little cluster here. Yeah, my goal was to knock him into that crevice right there and body block him, but I ended up missing the body block, so that was another misplay there. He should have died. But, yeah. yeah, I mean, and and then the same thing, you left, uh, you, you went in the direction that was the closest way to a fountain, and you let your team chase him in the longer direction while you cover the soak for your team, and he still makes it out, something like 21 health, and... Um, yeah, it was really unlucky. Yeah. So, now if you're in a situation where you've got to wave clear as much as possible, what abilities are you using and why? Generally, what I'll do is I'll E onto the wave and then I'll weave in my auto attacks to try to get the minions to all around the same health bar so that my next ability, generally I'll D and then Q to like clear and also heal. Uh, sometimes I'll W the wave to prevent damage that it's doing. So like right there you saw that I W'd the wave away to negate the damage it was doing to our fort. Uh, but in general, I try to avoid Wing in waves because it'll knock them away and make it harder to clear it overall. Okay. Right here, I mean, you pretty much just abuse Dauntless to make sure that you can do some damage yeah, to the structures. Just, just taking those for the XP. You're getting rather low on mana here. Is there a certain point that on Urel that you feel comfortable as far as mana, like... Uh, I mean, do you, do you always need to stay high of mana before a team fight, or is there a certain point you like to sit at? Uh, I think ha about half mana is generally good, as long as you are like conservative with it. 
since I know I have half mana here, I'm going to try to not waste it all. So I try to conserve it as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Where you could charge an extra E or charge an extra Q, you decide to just yeah. hold on, get a couple fountains, and then go from there. Or not fountains, uh, globes. Anyways. Globes, yeah. yeah. Um, Alright, next objective spawning top. We're level 13s. We're at that awkward point between mid and approaching late game. The enemies are 10 kills, you're at 4, but your soaking's been able to keep your team in the game so far, despite the fact that you have this major disadvantage. The enemy team has won the first curse. Um, I mean, like, what do you think? Is there anything that you're thinking to, to get a lead here, or are you just expecting that once you get into team fights later, you're going to be able to, to get a lot of value out of that? And, I, and we could also uh, talk about I'm this kind particular of... fight, because oh, this yeah. fight right here is wild. Dodge pretty much everything. Yeah, they missed a few abilities there. I was able to sidestep some of their abilities. Bait it out, shove. Uh, they're still diving here. They're diving onto me. I have my ult still if needed, but this Kira is kind of just out of position, so we ended up killing her. My goal is basically to just get 16, because that talent tier is a huge spike for this hero. Uh, Valence Chosen, obviously, at 13 is really nice as well. It's helped me get a few kills here. I think I end up killing this guy as well. Mm -hmm. I guess Alarak got that kill. <laughs> Back just a second before those minions showed up. <laughs> yeah. It's always, it's always a feels bad when it gets interrupted by something like that. And and in this situation, you have the choice, right, as your L to knock him towards your base so that. Uh, your turrets can help you clear this, and you have the choice to knock them away to reduce the, the damage that's being dealt to your structures. Um, in this case, you choose to knock them away. Is it purely because you know you have the time to just clear these, you don't need to speed this up, um, and you're, you're more worried about something? Or like, what's your idea of knocking them away in this situation compared to knocking it towards the towers? And I, I'll, well, I'll zoom over here. You do still have one tower available, but not the yeah. other one. Generally, I do recommend knocking them in. Right there, I was debating killing the Li Ming. I think had I sped myself up with Hand of Freedom and just charged her, I might have been able to get to her and kill her. But I didn't want the Siege Giants to just get a ton of value, so I ended up staying and just clearing those. Oh, so the plan was to knock them away so that they were safe, and then you could chase down Li Ming yeah, and just jump yeah, on her a couple exactly. times. I also wanted to negate any minimal damage they would do to the towers there just mm, i mean it is i knew i had the time no. yeah exactly right here i end up trait eing so that i can make sure i get onto her before she blinks away mm, and i do want to and point out I... that a, a trait e into an instant cast w uh was still able to do half of her health in an, in yeah, under a second exactly. so it was very very strong Here, I'm just jumping in. Kira ends up being annoying here. I know I can win this trade because I have my ult if needed, so I'm just trying to keep the Kira occupied here so my team can win the fight on the other side. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is, I mean, it, it's working. I just like how when your team does show up, you just pop Hand of Freedom, you walk away, you mount up, you charge up your E, and then you just, just wait steal for the kill, you know. <laughs> <laughs> No, and I mean, this is the thing that's so powerful about her is like, even while you were dealing with Kira, you kind of walked down to the team fight and like looked to see if there was something that you could do to still help your team. And then you were like, no, I think the best thing is just to keep Kira out of the team. Uh, this situation is another game of chicken. You decided to just walk in the only direction that he could teleport and just take him out. I try to keep jumping on Li Ming here for the kill, but because of her level one talent, she's able to blink my E, so I don't get the reset. I had to use my ult there to not die to these new towers, as mm -hmm. they are very powerful. Yeah, they do 40% more damage than they used to do, so they, yeah, uh, they're they they're pretty mean. Plus, they're reducing your armor, so that could even add up further, but uh, I don't know. It is it is crazy. Um, but you were able to actually full heal off of your ult there, and that's something Yeah, that is about. kind of nice, yeah. The, my ult does heal me a lot more because of the structure damage increase, so it is good to have. So we are now in what I like to call end game. Anything after level 16 is the end of the game. And oftentimes teams can just close out games off of a single team fight once we reach this end game. 
Uh, what are you looking for? I know a lot of times soul laners, like this is a time where you want to put less priority on soaking because death timers are so long. If you get caught out, you're done. And soaking ends up being a lot less experienced than just getting kills and winning team fights. Does your playstyle outside of team fights change at all as you're reaching late game with Ural? Uh, I'm kind of just staying near my team now because I don't want to get picked like you were talking about. I'm just helping them do camps and just staying near them because if they get invaded right now while they're doing a camp and I'm soaking a lane, if they lose that fight, the game could be over right there. So I just want to make sure I'm assisting them in any way I can. Mm -hmm. Now, as far as team fights, we're approaching what is going to be a team fight. Uh, mm -hmm. What are you changing? I mean, so far, you've been jumping in their back line and knocking their front line forward, or really knocking as many people towards your team as you possibly can. Does that change, or are, is that just reinforced now that you've taken this talent? It's pretty much going to be the exact same. The only difference here is... I should knock them back there, yeah. The only difference is sometimes I can just tap the W for the armor reduction and the percent chunk. Whereas, yeah, right there. I. I tap the W to get the minus armor on Garrosh, whereas earlier on in the game I'd recommend never tapping because it doesn't actually do anything. You usually want to just fully charge that W or trade and then W, mm -hmm. but at 16 you can just tap it for the all the benefits. And I think that's something that is... I don't think a lot of people actually know that about this talent because so many yeah. of her talents require... Uh, at maximum charge, at maximum charge, at maximum, or this one's actually just a slow, uh, but then yeah. this one's at maximum charge. And so many of her talents are at maximum charge. This one is just reduces the armor, does 7% of the health. And it's like, so just tapping it is, is, can get a huge portion of the value. Um, while if you, and so if you don't actually need the stun portion, but you just want a quick 7%, um, then that's and where... the minus twenty armor, yeah, yeah, it's, it's really really good. Like right, right there. I mean, she that was a the, full charge. That was a full charge, and then yeah, uh, to get the knockback. Tap twenty percent right of her armor is gone. You just did a thousand damage to her, and then boom, a new Brock was able to finish off that dead. last. It looked like about eight hundred health was left over, and then a new Brock just took it out in a single E. Yeah, the minus armor is a huge benefit. Mm-hmm. Do you so in this case you shot call and you tell your team to go for boss? Do you shot call often? I mean, you did hit number one grandmaster in North America, and you did it with an incredible win rate. Uh, is shot calling something that you think people should be trying to do all the time, <clears throat> or do you think they should just focus on their own game? I think it depends. Uh, I think if you have experience on the map and you, you're pretty confident in your calls, it's a good idea to shot call when you can. So, yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd recommend it if you're confident in it. Okay. I think it's a good idea. Like, like, I mean, you don't want to recommend someone shot call if they don't really know what they're doing, because then they could have just ended yeah, up making yeah. bad calls and causing them to get more losses than wins. So, uh, so in this case, the, the boss call, you get a curse uh, because of these team fights that you won, and despite having a uh, kill deficit this entire game, you guys are now up on kills, a full level lead, level and a half almost, and you guys are... you're jumping right in right here i get the unstoppable and then i knock them and they all have minus armor from the 16 talent mm -hmm. so they just end up dying here. oh yeah i garrosh tap it there for the minus armor. yeah garrosh gets specifically garrosh he gets countered by this talent because the armor that he gains passively his entire kit is revolved around that and if you do the minus 20 armor to him it's just gonna shred him instantly mm-hmm yeah, his health is his health and survivability is balanced off of having that armor. So if he loses it, he's actually one of the squishiest tanks in the game. Uh, and so in cases that you can get that armor, and in fact, there's uh, been a little bit of math done about armor and having reducing armor on a target that that has no armor versus reducing armor on a target that has armor, and it's much more valuable to do it on a target that has armor. So this is a huge talent for taking out Garrosh. Uh, so we are at the end of this particular game. You guys dominated. Um, the build, straightforward. If we were to look at the stats, I mean, you kept the team in the game with the experience that you contributed. Uh, the amount of siege damage you did is pretty good considering this isn't normally what people would consider a siege hero. The majority of the siege damage was just on 
soak as well as i mean minions and then but you did still aggressively take a couple turrets a few times so uh i mean overall this is a very impactful game let's 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 reiterate some of the earlier things in this game and kind of go from the start and break down the early mid late game early game what's your focus pretty much just soak or is there anything else that you're looking at Early game, it's going to depend highly on what your team wants to do. If your team wants to look for invades, URL is very good at invading. So you can go with them to invade if you see a good opportunity. But in general, I'd recommend just soaking, trying to double soak if possible. The way you're going to want to soak in lane, because you no longer have Marauds inside for that sustain, you're going to want to trade into Q as much as you can, just off cooldown for that sustain. Uh, you're going to want to E on top of the wave. Weave in your auto attacks to get all of their health to around the same amount so that you can kill them all with your uh, AoE damage. That's pretty much it for the early game. Depends okay. a lot on what your team wants to do. And so as far as mid game goes, and, I, and I'm talking as far as mid game is usually level 10 to level 14-ish. Uh, what is your, your, your play style outside of team fights, and what's your play style in team fights what should everyone if they could just remember two things about mid game what would you tell them uh just try not to get picked mid game that's usually when people are looking to kill you so that they can win the next objective without you there so just be really careful to get to not get picked you saw up in the top lane they tried to get that pick on me but i was able to dodge their abilities and get out of there because of hand of freedom uh in team fights your goal almost always in team fights with this build is going to be to jump onto the back line, preferably from out of vision, so they don't expect it. And then you're going to want to trade into W to knock them back towards your team so they can follow up and look for kills. And then after that, you're just going to try to click E as much as you can with your level 7 talent and just get as many resets as possible. Look to harass the back line. Mm-hmm. And then finally, late game, uh, we don't really need a refresher on it because we just saw what happened with it. Uh, the power of that level 16 talent, you can knock their entire team into a wall, you can knock them towards your team, and losing that armor allowed your team to just walk through them. So uh, we don't really need a refresher on it. Stick with your team in the late game. W, drop them. Uh, let's go really quick, and we're going to talk a little bit about matchups, uh, but we're going to go rather quickly through it. So... Uh, if you were to just give like one thing to look out for and then one, I mean, even just like one thing that you can abuse or one thing that you can look out for, for common, uh, solo laners that you might be facing. So starting off Deathwing, uh, anything in particular that we should know about facing a Deathwing, particularly all of these are going to be kind of the early game because once you get into team fights, everything's going to shift around based off the teams. Yeah. But when you are on, let's say, Brax's holdout or Dragonshire, and you just need to hold that point for a while, what are your tips against each of these heroes uh, for taking them out in the solo lane? So, say you're going against a Deathwing in the solo lane, what are your what what's your tip against the Deathwing? Deathwing is going to be very hard to deal with until late game. So early game. Just try to clear the wave, uh, jump onto the wave, weave in the auto attacks, try to get lane priority on him because his wave clear is not that good as soon as he runs out of energy from breathing on it. So mm -hmm. you can get wave priority on him pretty well just by jumping on the wave and then trait queuing for that sustain. When it comes to the point fight, he can beat you depending on his build and how he plays and stuff. So just try to get wave priority and then get the beacon try to avoid fighting him because it's going to be hard to beat him until late game okay so avoid deathwing for the most part uh imperious anything that we need to know facing imperious imperious what makes imperious so good against you know tanky or offlaners this is level one talent does percent damage the way he applies that percent damage is when he activates his aoe ability he'll auto attack you for 2.5 percent additional damage of your health so the way we can prevent this is we can trade into him, and as soon as he clicks that, you can DW to knock him away and negate that percent damage. Try to avoid him when he clicks that AoE damage. And just constantly try to click Q to self-sustain yourself. Mm -hmm. So Imperius, when Imperius uses his E, his AoE ring that's around him that, that fires off those little fire uh, things at you, 
uh, trait W. And so Ooh. jump on him, hit him. He pops that trait W. You walk away until that time's out. And then jump back on him. And while that's on cooldown, you win the trade. Uh, exactly. Mirror matches. I'm just kidding. No mirror matches. Uh, <laughs> Mouth Ale. What do you do against Mouth Ale? So Mouth Ale is going to be the one hero that is just going to beat you always unless he's misplaying. So the way you're going to want to play against Mouth Ale is just avoid him. Clear the lane and try to jump onto the minions. Just clear him. He's going to try to hit you. As soon as he tries to hit you, you're just going to want to knock him away before he hits you if possible. Because when he applies that mark, he's going to be doing a lot of damage to you. So just in general, try to not let him tag you. Because when he tags you, it's going to be hard to get that tag off of yourself. Mm -hmm. So Ragnaros, um, you should be able to beat Ragnaros, I'd imagine. But what, yeah, are, what are the things that people really need to focus on just to beat Ragnaros? Beating Ragnaros is it's really easy because of Dauntless. His main source of damage is from his auto attacks. So because of Dauntless, he's not going to be able to hurt you very much. So you're just going to want to jump on him, auto attack him. Uh, constantly click DQ for that sustain. That's something you should always be doing with this hero, depending on the matchup, obviously. But yeah, just click DQ, clear the lane, auto attack him when you can, and he shouldn't be able to do anything to you mm -hmm. i'd like to point out a little bit about ragnaros as well it, it, he heals a lot more when he's hitting a lot of targets i would recommend trying to fight him away from your wave if you can uh and then dauntless yeah. also reduces his healing by half so adding that up as well uh twin blades i'd imagine just taking dauntless now is going to make you have a really good yeah. matchup against twin blades uh dahaka anything in particular that we should know about dahaka so dahaka is interesting if the Dahaka player is good, when you try to cast your E ability on the wave to clear it, he can drag you mid-air and negate that E damage. So it's it's really awkward in that lane. You're just going to want to channel your E and just sort of... It's like a skill matchup. You're going to want to bait him to use his Q if possible before you E. Or maybe catch him off guard and E on the wave before he can drag you. Mm -hmm. But in general, when it comes to just fighting him, you're going to want to do the same thing of just constantly... DQing for that self-sustain, and he won't be able to kill you unless you uh, miss a lot of your abilities. You yeah. should just win the trade by DQing constantly. Okay. Zul is really popular in the meta right now, and a very strong hero. Uh, there are two unique playstyles that I've seen from Zul in the competitive scene so far. Uh, so, if you have a couple tips for either of these, that would be awesome. W build is probably the more prominent one. Being able to swipe a lot, getting a ton of healing back while you're swiping, reducing everyone's attack speed, and later in the game, reducing everyone's damage. Um, and then Q build is the other one, staying a little bit safer and using your Q to summon a bunch of skeletons, which then heal you and give you your mana back. Any particular way that you deal with either of those playstyles on Zul? So Zul definitely is very, very good. He's often first banned in pretty much every game that I see, but if you do end up playing against it, depending on his level 1 talent, if he takes Backlash, which is the most prominent one, I'd say, it does 12% of your health bar if he blows up with that activated. If he does take that, try to knock him away before that hits you. In general, though, just jump onto the wave, try to clear it. He is going to be spawning skeletons, so it's going to be really hard to trade into him in that wave. If you're going to fight him, make sure you're fighting him outside of the wave, if possible, because if you fight him outside of the wave, you can beat him. Especially after level 4, when you have Hand of Freedom to cleanse that root that he's going to be casting on you constantly. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a big piece of it, is that root you can just immediately remove. Artanis, yeah, um, I mean, we don't see a lot of them, but they do show up on, like, BOE. Uh, anything in particular that you would want to do against Artanis if you did face one that you had to beat in lane? Uh, Artanis, he's interesting because he wins pretty much every matchup, technically, because his shields are just going to be too much for you to break through that early on in the game. So, for example, on Braxis or Dragonshire... You're not going to be able to break his shields unless you have like somebody roam up, but say you're just 1v1-ing. You're just going to want to jump on the point and knock him away and just take that point if possible because his main weakness is he can't really get onto you. So if you just keep knocking him away, you can control that beacon. Uh, in lane, 
his wave clear is not very good, so you can just win there just by winning the wave, and then he'll have to go soak that lane, and he'll probably just end up dropping the beacon because he has to soak. If he decides to fight on the beacon, you can just knock him off of it, and he'll be losing soak. So it's that's the reason you don't see many Artanis pickers. Mm -hmm. It's okay. kind of like the Rexar idea on those. Is you your goal is to even if you don't technically win the matchup, you can just always soak and hold the point, and they always exactly, have to go back yeah. and cover the soak, and that's why they usually lose the point. Speaking of which, um, <laughs> what are your ideas against Rexar? Rexar is a very hard matchup. Anytime you click E, try to channel that E ability, he's going to stun you with Misha. If he's a uh, good at Rexar, it's it's going to be really hard to win that matchup. I don't really know how to win that, to be honest. I think you just lose. I mean, I just recommend I think generally, if you're going to be playing a lot of Urel, these are the matchups that you need to know because you need to go, okay, if we want to win on Braxis, we need to ban Rexar and Zul because that would make this a much easier matchup. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and I think that's kind of the issue is with Rexar and Braxis and D-Shire is hopefully your team's just going to ban him. Um, yeah, that's... That's generally what that's, happens. That's yeah. the hope, anyways. Uh, Leoric, anything? It, I mean, I'd imagine again, this is, should be another one that you should be able to win. Comes down to yeah. the um, the can you knock him back? I mean, if, if he, I guess best case scenario, he swipes you, he W's you, and then he presses E and baits your W. But that's like, I would say a third of his right. mana for you to just walk away yeah, or use exactly. your E to hop away. There's a lot of controversy because a lot of people think Leoric is good in DRL, that he, he can do well in lane, and he can, but the way he needs to win is he has to land his W and then E immediately, like you were talking about, to avoid your knockback to get you out of the range. And if he does that, he loses all of his mana. So eventually you're just going to win through sustain because you should be constantly DQing in lane. If, uh, if he's just Eing your... DW, there's no point casting it. So just try to avoid his W. If he doesn't land every single W, you're going to win really easily. And even if he does, eventually you're just going to out-sustain him because he's going to lose all of his mana trying to E your Ws. Mm -hmm. As far as um, Thrall, we're not going to focus too much on Thrall. Uh, he, he's one of those that uh, he can poke you, but you should be able to outstain the poke. Yeah. And then Dauntless if, is just going to kill Yeah, and if you can't ever get them low enough that Ancestral is going to kill, Thrall's not ever really going to beat a URL. All you have to do is make sure Dauntless is up and use your trait Q. And I mean, I can tell you that because I play a lot of Thrall and I can tell you exactly how to deal with it. Um, <laughs> Chen, Sonya, uh, let's let's start off with Sonya and we'll end off on Chen. So Sonya, what are you looking for? Sonya, you should win that matchup. Um, the way that Sonya wins is... She has to try to spear you mid-E, which is going to be really hard to do if you're casting it in a minion wave, because she's not going to be able to get around those minions a lot of the time. It depends on the scenario, obviously, but the way she wins is she's going to have to spin off of the wave to heal up, because that's her only form of self-sustain there. So you, you want to make sure you're holding your trait and your W to stop that spin immediately, and you should just be fine if you do that, which means you're going to have to be fully charging your Q just like without the trait, which is something you don't generally do, but in this matchup you're going to have to do that because you need to hold that trait to knock back her spin when she tries to cast it. So generally poke with E, use Q to self-sustain, and hold your trait to stop hold her your from trait. spinning because yeah. then she can't heal. So then at that point you're pretty much just going against a gray main. Um, <laughs> and so now on to Chen. Chen is one of those where I don't know if you know this. I hosted a 1v1 tournament a while back and Chen dominated almost the entire thing and only lost to a single death against a Zul'jin who was able to take an entire double turret and fort off of that single death. So Chen in wow. my eyes is still one of the dominants for these one-on-ones. What's your play against Chen? Chen is another one of those heroes that can beat you. Um, it's it's a very high skill matchup. Generally, I lose to Chen's if they're playing the Chen correctly. What he's going to do is his build. It's going to depend on his build. If he has Accumulating Flame, that's his main source of damage on you. So if he doesn't have that, yeah, at level 4. 
if he doesn't have that, you should just be able to win very easily because he won't have enough damage to get through you. But if he does, he's going to try to ignite you and then constantly auto attack you and just keep refreshing that flame. And it's it's going to do a lot of damage. Um, I do think that if you, if you can knock him back immediately after he tosses his oil on you and walk away, you might be able to beat him. I haven't really tested it much because I haven't seen many Chen's lately, but generally I just avoid, if he ignites you with that level 4 talent, run away from him and just don't trade into him. Just constantly try to knock him back if he does that and just constantly spam your abilities for the Dauntless and the self-sustain on your Q. Your wave priority is going to be better because your wave clear is just better normally, mm -hmm. naturally, because he has to hold his... His only way to clear the lane is with the oil and the igniting. But if he casts that on the wave, then he can't do anything to you. So he has to hold it. So you're going to always have wave priority on him. Okay. Now, I'm not. we're not going to go through all of the ranged heroes, but let's say you get in a position where you're going against a Raynor. Let's say you get in a position where you're going against a Zagara. Um, they, they throw a, a Gray Man against you just because their draft kind of required them to do something weird. And or you're just kind of in a rank where people just don't want to pick a solo laner. Uh, what is your major strategy for dealing with a range here? Is it primarily just abusing bushes because they can't auto attack you in a bush, and then you charge up your E while you're in the bush? Um, Dauntless, yeah. do you change anything up, or is it just about the same against range heroes? It's pretty much exactly that what you just said. You just you want to abuse bushes against them, and you want to jump on for, onto them from out of vision. The Rainer has the ability to Q you out of your E if you can time it well. So you want to try to avoid that by casting it from out of a bush. It's going to be a lot harder for him to predict it at that point. Uh, Zagara, she just doesn't have enough damage to kill you if you're constantly trading and then queuing. So as long as you're just trading and queuing, clearing that creep and jumping on her when you can from out of vision, you're going to beat Zagara pretty easily. Rainer, all of his damage is auto attacks, and you have Dauntless, so he can't really do anything to you if you're just constantly trading and queuing and clearing the lane. Sounds good. And that is it. So, Liam, where can everyone find you? Do you have a Twitter, a Twitch? If you do, we're going to link them down below. Is there a specific schedule you stream on, or... Anything that we need to know about you, because I know a lot of people are going to be wanting to watch you play Urel, and they're probably going to want to learn some other heroes, because after this video, Urel is going to get nerfed. No, I'm just kidding. But um, <laughs> no, I mean, where, where can they find you? Uh, yeah, I have a Twitter at uh, twitter.com slash Liam underscore hots. Uh, I have a Twitch, twitch.com slash Liam underscore hots. Um, I don't really have a schedule right now, but I'm going to start streaming a lot more consistently, hopefully. Uh, it's It's been hard with the pandemic and everything, and my internet has been a lot worse, but I think it's just due to the pandemic, sadly. So it it should get a lot better uh, since, hopefully, the pandemic is going to be getting better. <laughs> hopefully. Um, and with, with that being said, though, thank you so much for this. I mean, I, I took an hour of your time and everyone who's watched this video, I hope this hour has been enlightening. Um, but at the same time, my hope is that I'll have this scheduled out to where it will post at a time that you are streaming so that guys, if you finish this hour long video and you want to go see him streaming, Hopefully we have this all timed out. You can go check out his stream right now. Check down in the description below. You will see not only the copy and paste link of the URL build, so you guys can throw that in there. You will see a link to all of Liam's social media as well as his Twitch. Go see if he's streaming right now. And if he's not, give him a follow. Make sure that notification's on so you can see when he does start streaming again. Liam, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was was fun. I hope you guys learned a lot. All right, and thank you guys. Feel free to check out any of my other videos as well.